Good morning and welcome once again to Holy Trinity. On behalf of Pastor Katie and myself, we're really glad that you and your family have been able to spend this time this weekend with us in worship, whether online or again in person today. We again want to remind you that in addition to our service that's online, we also are gathering each Sunday outdoors at 9 a.m., gathering under the canopy, gathering in our cars in the parking lot to share worship together there and share Holy Communion as well. Again, we hope that you can be part of that experience as well whenever it is safe to do so. If you're on the lawn, we again remind you to come masked and come prepared to distance so that all can be safe in that particular environment. And again, a reminder too that um, when it comes to whether it's live, or whether it's recorded, however we are able to do our worship together, that God has been promised to be present with us. And so it's our hope that, at that our worship today challenges you, if that's what you need today, comforts you, if that's what you need today, as ever the need may be. And again, reminds you just again how much God longs to be with you, longs to claim you as his child, longs for you to feel that love as it reaches out to you today. So whatever the case may be, let's now center our hearts and our minds to prepare to offer up this gift of worship to God. As we do, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's now begin by sharing our opening song, shall we? Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart Lord, I need to be with us, to be our help in times of trouble. 
Yet still things happen far outside of our control, and often in ways where it's hard to know where to find you, or look for signs of your presence or your purpose. May we reawaken our imaginations, Lord, that your word might speak to us afresh today. And again, that our hearts and our ears and our eyes might show us again how close you long to be, and just how wide God's amazing love is. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, boys and girls. Glad you could be with us today for the children's sermon. And uh, again, I hope your day is going well and your summer is going well. I've got a story I'd like to share with you today. And it's a story about a little squirrel by the name of Leonardo. Leonardo lived in a forest full of gray squirrels, except that he happened to be a red squirrel. As a matter of fact, he was the only red squirrel in the entire forest. And the gray squirrels love to play with one another, to chase each other up and down the trees and around. They just loved being together. And yet, Leonardo also wanted to play. And he wanted to be part of the fun too. He wished he had somebody to play with. And so he was so lonely, he went and he asked the gray squirrels, he said, hey, he said, do you mind if I play with you as well? Sorry, Red, they said, you're the wrong color. Go away, you're bothering us. Oh yeah, Leonardo thought, we'll see about that. And before the gray squirrels could even begin to blink, Leonardo ran up the tree that they had been running and chasing each other through. And he turned around and said, catch me if you can. And before those gray squirrels even stopped to think about what color Leonardo was. They were off and running, chasing him through the trees, and they spent the entire afternoon doing so. As a matter of fact, they did so until their mothers called them home for supper. And as they went home for supper, they yelled back to Leonardo, see you tomorrow, we'll catch you then. They didn't even think about what color he was. And Leonardo wasn't lonely anymore. Sometimes, you know, we just have to act in order to be able to imagine something different than the way things are. Sometimes we have to push a little harder than may be comfortable to be able to make the kind of changes happen we think are necessary. Leonardo was brave enough to do so in his place and in his time. The question now for you and me is will we be that brave? And so as you begin to think about entering into a new school year, entering into a new classroom perhaps, I invite and I challenge you to be brave, to do what you know is right, to do and you have to push things just a little bit harder than is comfortable for you to do in order to see the change happen that you know needs to happen. Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman came from that vicinity, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Lord, help me. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Word, word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Good morning once again to our worship today. We're glad that you're with us. If you've been up to around Cedar Rapids or surrounding areas in recent days, chances are you've discovered a landscape that looks virtually foreign to anything that you remember. As a matter of fact, if the floods of 2008 and 2016 have certainly left their mark on the area, then this most recent storm last week changed virtually the landscape of every corner of the community, such that the residents there, when they, when they looked out their window, had to feel as though like they were on, living on a different planet then they woke up on that morning. I know that I certainly had a hard time recognizing the, 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 the neighborhood where we used to live. Such was the nature of the devastation that we found. And in that light, it's certainly comforting sometimes for us to know in the midst of such unprecedented change, 
that Jesus Christ, in fact, is someone who, again, his love for us doesn't change, that we can count on that, that that's a stable element in our lives above all. As a matter of fact, one of the fundamental tenets of my faith is recorded in the 13th chapter of Hebrews, where it says that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the same again yesterday and today and forever. I find comfort in that fact, and I trust that many of you have too, again, especially amidst so much change around us. And yet, the account we have before us today, this story of how Jesus reacts to this desperate Canaanite woman, perhaps makes you have to pause just for a moment in that respect. Because, in fact, there have been times in the history of the church when, when we've simply wanted to toss this story out altogether. There have been times when we had just been utterly embarrassed by it about anything else. Because for all the scenarios where Jesus seems to fit so well, our stereotype of being consistently sympathetic and compassionate and gentle, this one simply seems to break the mold. In fact, Jesus' behavior toward this woman, I dare say, would be one you could describe as, as disrespectful and dismissive, as offensive to even the most insensitive ears for that matter, and sometimes just plain downright racist, right? I mean, that was the nature of what this was about. And his comments, his backward comments in reference to her as a dog, is no less offensive in, in his day as, as hurling the name of a female canine and a woman in our day would be. And so it makes me, for one, if, if recall all the times in which I was so quickly judgmental of the Pharisees who had a long track record of opposing Jesus, no matter what he said, well, here's one of those instances where I'd be awfully tempted to join their ranks, quite frankly, because the story simply leaves me with my jaw dropped and my illusion shattered. Now, since the story did, in fact, make it into the Bible and made it into stay, again, over the years, a lot of folks have attempted to kind of clean it up a little bit, to sort of excuse away the words and behavior of Jesus here. Some suggest, for instance, that, that he was, his ignoring the woman was, was just a test of her faith, perhaps. Or others might say that his, he was just staying focused on his initial mission to the people of Israel. Or that the word he uses for dog is really more like puppy, a more affectionate word, perhaps. But I've got to tell you, I don't buy a bit of that. Because none of that cuts it as an excuse. If you are the one who is being, in fact, offended, you are the one who is being minimized. So instead, I can't help but believe that, that, that it's just one excellent reminder of how Jesus wasn't just divine, wasn't just the Son of God, wasn't just fully divine, but in fact, he was also fully human as well. That again, that he was subject to, to all the sort of temptations that you and I might have been subject to. And that perhaps again, part of that is being subject to change as well, for that matter, right? Just as we will. And again, even subject to some of the, again, stereotypes and, and racism built almost automatically into any dialogue between Jews and Canaanites in his day. And that implies, if that's the case, that Jesus was also perhaps subject to change as well. That maybe he had to reconsider just how wide, in fact, was God's mercy and how, how, how inherent that quality was to just who God was. Because of the prophets before him so often discovered over and over through the years, as he discovered himself for that matter, sometimes pushing the boundaries, again, was sometimes inherent. It's just a fundamental, basic part of being faithful. So let's first explore a little bit of the context of, of this incident, if you would. The story takes place in a ways north and west of, of Jerusalem and Capernaum, where Jesus called his, his hometown, for that matter, in a place called Tyre and Sidon, just south of what's modern-day Beirut. Translation? pagan land. To a Jew, this was literally a spiritual slum, a veritable ghetto of unbelief in which, in which residents were likely to believe in Herod if they, and worship Herod if they worshipped anyone. In fact, it may have been that Jesus headed here in the first place because it was a good place to hide. 
Some have suggested that, again, after the crowds chasing him around uh, Lake Galilee and his, his not having any real opportunity yet to grieve the loss, the violent death of his cousin John, he must have been just flat out exhausted, emotionally run out. And perhaps that's the cause for his apparent dismissal and refusal and insensitivity here. Whatever the case, the woman approaches Jesus and again lays out her request. Probably not just once initially, but repeatedly. The way an excited pup might in fact jump up on household guests and doesn't know what enough is enough. And again, unwittingly, she plays right into every stereotype virtually that, that again, the disciples may have had of, of her people. She was, she was shrill, she was overtly direct, she was presumptuous, and her family had a problem with a demon. Don't they all? You can almost hear Peter muttering under his breath. The disciples, in other words, are, are really annoyed with her behavior at best, and by her unwillingness to accept silence as an answer. So they act as bouncers, offering to shoo her away. It reminds me of all too often how even today we still have trouble sympathizing oftentimes with people whose experiences is quite different perhaps than, than our own. That if, if the oppression or the injustice of the pain isn't happening to, to our people, our gender, our race, our, our community, our sexuality, then, then we're tempted to dismiss it away as, as unwelcomed, unjustified noise. Jesus, at the same time, seems preoccupied somehow because, because Matthew doesn't even record him acknowledging the woman's presence at this point, despite her crying out. And so she does so again. She cries out to him again. She has nothing to lose. And she says again, Kyrie, Lord, have mercy. And this is where Jesus suggests that, again, it's not fitting that, that food that's intended for the children be given to the dogs. The way I understand that, I understand that in the best possible sense of the term, is that he clearly understands, again, the focus of his mission, its restrictions, its direction. And, and it could be said for him that, that again, he, as he set his face toward Jerusalem and what, knowing what was going to happen there, and he had to stay focused, that the same, in fact, was happening here. That he knew that sometimes that in order to accomplish great things, you have to say no to good things. So this then becomes Jesus' opportunity to either stick to his guns, stay the course, continue to focus on salvation for the Jews alone, or to forever change the scope of his mission. But the woman here somehow grasps on the fact that the God's initial nature is to be merciful if it is anything. She gets that fact. And furthermore, she knows, in fact, that while mercy might begin with the Jews, it wasn't going to end there. So she was not going to throw away her shot. She persists, as it were. She persists in coming back to him once again, like Sojourner Truth, like Rosa Parks, the Canaanite woman, again, persisted like so many other women like her have done so. Done so oftentimes as lone minority voices, again, among a majority of authoritative and, and powerful men. But they won't go away. They won't be simply discarded and dismissed. And it's a darn good thing that they have a backbone in this and that their backbone is, in fact, so strong. Again, sometimes being pushy is a fundamental part of being faithful. In this case, the Canaanite woman isn't going to take no for an answer. She hears Jesus' response, but if she responds, yes, Lord, but even the dogs get the crumbs from the master's table. And Jesus is forced to do a double take. With not a word spoken of what she believed or who she worshipped, she in fact becomes the only person in any gospel whatsoever whose faith Jesus declares to be great. Why? I think it's because of her humility, because of her persistence. Exactly, again, the lessons that, that Peter could have benefited from last week when he was trying to walk on water. Because as I see it, see, Jesus was thus converted that day. Right? 
He, in fact, was, in fact, changed to a larger vision of, of what the commonwealth of God looks like. He saw and he heard a fuller revelation of God in the words and in the face of this foreign woman. Her truth is evident in the way Matthew actually tells the story. Because at the end of this chapter, there is another feeding story. Similar to the one that we heard of just a couple weeks ago in the previous chapter. This time, 4,000 men are fed besides women and children. And there are seven baskets left over this time instead of 12. Why? Well, in Scripture, you see, seven is the number that represents wholeness. It represents completeness that, in fact, includes a number that encompasses, in other words, all nations, everyone. So Matthew seems to have placed this story, again, of Jesus and this woman between these two feeding stories. And the Canaanite woman taught Jesus that she and her daughter deserve more than crumbs, such that after this encounter, Jesus went out to feed those who had not yet been fed. So the next question, I guess, I suppose, for us to be asking is that if Jesus can change that day, can we? If certainly every generation has some people who are other and puts them down under the table, we could make a long list of people that we see as, as being different, whether it's in terms of race or class or citizenship status or different religions, whatever the case may be. Perhaps, again, my interpretation of this story makes you a bit nervous that way as it sometimes makes me. Maybe it doesn't sit well with you, and again, that's okay. Because sometimes, as the woman has shown us, being pushy is part of being faithful. But if that's the case for you, then I'll suggest at least one last option for how it is that you might hear and might view this story. At least one commentator has suggested that perhaps that what's happening here is, is, an, is that Jesus is, is using another parable to make his point. That in other words, by using language like Canaanite and, and dog, Jesus and Matthew are, are purposely articulating the racism they saw amongst their people and their culture. And just where Jesus gets the assent of, of everyone in the room, the disciples nodding along again with heads and, and rolling their eyes, he pulls the rug out from under them by curing the woman's daughter after all. Again, just to make his point. It may be a stretch, perhaps, but from this perspective, in the course of their verbal sparring match, again, maybe Jesus may have winked at the woman, disclosing to her, at least, that there's more than meets the eye than his obvious racist language that he uses here. He will heal her daughter, as she has requested. In the process, he's about to teach his own countrymen, his own disciples, a lesson in God's all-embracing love. Either way, it still points for the need to change, right? And to be changed. The need that sometimes, again, being pushy is, again, an, uh, an instrumental part of being faithful. That, that sometimes we have to push beyond what's easy and predictable and comfortable in order to take up the call that Jesus would have us take up. All of which makes me wonder, are we called to be like the Canaanite woman? To again, not let any barrier stand in the way of love? For some of us, maybe that's our primary obstacle and primary point here. Are we to, to learn to see Jesus in a new light as one who could be changed, and, and so therefore we can be too. Perhaps so. Are we to be like Jesus in, in this way? We're to, with those who are able to, to learn anew that, that faith can be discovered and lived out with people among whom we might least expect to find it. Maybe that's a goal for you today. Or are we called to recognize that the boundaries of those who belong and those who don't seem to be ever expanding? Are we to, to, to again wonder what, what that looks like for us now in our day and age, in our time, in this world where, again, the forces of hate and fear and bigotry would exclude and suppress the voices of those who seem to be so different from us, who are privileged 
and whose voices tend to dominate so much. Is it one of those? That's the question we should be asking, or is it perhaps all of the above? It was a point, again, just to be open to such holy surprise. I expect my call in the days ahead is to be open to that surprise. As the end, Jesus certainly seems to be. Amen. Now, as we recall, both our own individual need for God and also, again, the needs of neighbors across our county, across our region, and certainly across our world, let's lift them up, lift one another up today in Christ's name. I invite you to join me to pray. Lord, we live in a world longing to see relief, reconciliation, peace. We pray for all nations, asking that their leaders and their peoples might let your justice shine through them. We pray for your church that it might be faithful and obedient to your call and seek to live out your gospel with integrity and intentionality. Help us to reach out with compassion to all of our neighbors who are still reeling from the incredible devastation caused by recent storms that they too may not feel alone. We pray specifically today, God, for our congregation as we approach a new program year together. We might seek to have each person among us grow in their understanding and their spiritual disciplines and their discipleship and thus their ability to follow you even in these tough times. Help us make the tough choices necessary to avoid trivializing our faith, that your mission might be extended in any way that it can. Father, we lift up teachers and administrators, support staff and students as a new school year begins. We pray for our mission partners at Water to Thrive as our next well is being dug. We pray for those building schools in Afghanistan and Afghanistan and Pakistan and Sudan and other areas where children and people living in poverty need hope and means for a healthy future. Lord, we certainly want to pray for those who are grieving this morning, including Fran Meyer at the loss of her brother-in-law. And the family of Ted Chambers will be buried on Sunday. The families of those who have lost so much in recent storms, may the promise of resurrection give them hope and give them peace today. God, we also want to pray for those we know among us who live with chronic illness, those who are hospitalized or homebound, healing in body or mind or spirit in any way. We pray, especially for those today who are recovering from recent injuries or those who we know to be undergoing cancer treatment, remind each of them of the hope and the love that simply will not let us go. God, we pray in thanksgiving for new life in our midst, including for the Camacho family who welcomed the son, Mateo, last month. Give them assurance of your presence with them in the sacred season. Then for all the other things that we pray for or ought to be prayed for, Lord, as we share the petitions spoken only in our hearts. Whatever the case may be, gracious God, hear these our prayers and receive them for the sake of the crucified and risen one. And hear us again as we pray the prayer you taught your first disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. After the resurrection, Jesus stood among his first disciples and offered them the gift of his peace, saying, Peace be with you. And so may the peace of the Lord be with you today as well. Let's take a moment now to share a sign, a word of that peace with those with whom we're blessed to gather today. Star away. Good 
Once again, we want to thank you for being part of our online worship today. Remind you again that just God loves to have you offer up that gift. God receives that gift with thanksgiving. And we pray now that God would embolden us 
would encourage us both to be present for one another, to be present for our neighbors in need. Again, just to be present to the body and, and, and the hands and feet of Christ at work in the world, wherever we find ourselves this week, right? So may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's go now in peace, shall we? To love, live, and share Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.